Good morning, everybody. I'm super excited to be here. So uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary for ASALT, what is that? So ASALT is the organization in the Army that buys everything, really. We buy all of the equipment for soldiers, uh, business systems for you know the generating force for the users back in the Pentagon or wherever uh, we develop and, and um, field those as well. And then you know tanks, uh, network stuff, mission command applications, all of that is, is under ASALT. And I have the privilege of being in charge of really how we are modernizing and digitally transforming, uh, particularly from the standpoint of data engineering, digital engineering, and software, and cyber, and all that fun stuff. So uh, let's go to the next chart. So we are digitally transforming, as is kind of everybody, right? I mean, we're probably not as far ahead as some of the folks in industry just because there are some things that we have to address um, that I'm going to talk about today so that we can get there faster. But that's really what we've been doing for about the last two years. So I will say, I'm just going to give you a little teaser. I got there two years ago. And this position was new. So I'm the first Deputy Assistant Secretary for Data Engineering and Software for ASALT. If you had asked me then, did I think that two years from then I'd be standing here telling you all the stuff we've already done, I would have said no, <laughs> because there's a lot of bureaucracy, right? And I mean, it's just, it's hard to make change in any large organization, and the Army is huge. And so I didn't really anticipate that we would be able to do as much as we've done. And so I'm going to talk to you today about some of the things we've done and also some of the things we're doing. But I will say it's, it's a lot. And so now I'm very comfortable saying we are accelerating our digital transformation because we've laid the foundation. We've already started. We're really, I would say, far down the path. And so that, that's exciting for me. So let's go to the next chart. So I want to talk about the software directive first. And I don't know if you guys are, um, you may have heard of it. You may not. There's been a lot of press. So one of the first things we did two years ago was figure out very quickly, like, we have to help all of our programs embrace modern software practices. This is, for you guys in industry, you're like, of course. I mean, that's what we've been doing you know, for years. But again, DOD is not always you know, right on the cutting edge of that stuff because there's a lot of other things that we have to consider. So we set out to figure out what are the things that we have to change within the Army to really be able to embrace agile software development and CICD. Because it's very easy for us to put in a contract Industry, this is what we want you to do. We want you to deliver you know, in a CICD fashion. We want you to do Agile. But the thing is, our processes were not able to accept that and to you know, enable that. So that we did a lot of work to figure out what are all of the things that we need to do to be able to get there. And that was all codified in a software directive that the um, Secretary of the Army signed and announced at the South by Southwest conference in March. And it's really a very exciting thing because a lot of the work that we have done, um, actually all of the work that we've done, is really the meat of that directive. So what are some of the new things that the Army is doing? So there's a bunch of stuff. I'm not going to go through all of it. But test and evaluation. Um, when we were prior to this, that meant OK, I'm going to develop my thing. And then two years later, I'm going to test it, right? Obviously, that, that's not effective. That's not, that's not how it works. And so now what the directive says is that the Army will take vendor test data. Um, we will automate as much as we can. We will leverage the tests that the vendor is already doing when we contract with the vendor and really use that for credit. And that is a big deal, because that's not how we've been operating, right? So that's, that's for us, you know, I'm, again, for industry, not that big of a deal. For the Army, a big deal. Um, we have stood up a digital contracting center of excellence at Aberdeen Proving Ground. What does that mean? That means all of our digital work is going there. So if there's anything in the software data engineering space, 
primary contracting decisions are going to be made by Danielle Moyer, who is the SCO for um, the Aberdeen Proving Ground ACC. And the reason she was selected to do that is, number one, she's amazing. She's fantastic. She was my deputy at my previous job for five years, so I know, I know her really, really well. Um, she's very much an out-of-the-box thinker, and she is making contracting rapid, which I know that's like an oxymoron, but she's doing it. I mean, we're putting out stuff very quickly, being able to award stuff a lot quicker, and doing a lot of innovative things, orals and demos instead of, you know, written proposals, hundreds of pages that everybody has to write and read that nobody really wants to do. So there's a lot of change there, and a lot of other stuff that we've changed. Um, if you want to see, read the whole directive, it's available at the Army publication website. But really, I think the takeaway is we are changing all of our processes so that we can ask you guys to deliver agile CICD fashion and be able to actually leverage what you provide with our processes being able to accept it. OK, so one of the things I forgot to mention on the previous chart is that the software directive has a data section. Um, and what the data section refers to is this unified data reference architecture that is something else that my group has been developing for about a year and a half. Uh, we went out, we were very collaborative with industry. So this architecture is data mesh based, um, something that is really actually that is pretty new even to industry is the concept of a data mesh. And the reason that we chose a data mesh over other types of architectures is because if you think about how we operate in the battlefield, we are disconnected sometimes. We cannot always count on you know, being able to reach back to, to a mothership anywhere. Um, we're distributed, we're decentralized, and the data mesh architecture allows us to, in fact, that is what it is. So it allows us to operate that, well, that way very well. And when we're connected, then we can reconnect and you know, we have a lot more capability, but we always, the Army will always have to be able to operate disconnected. And so um, this architecture is kind of made for us. So we developed this reference architecture. We, have, we put out three RFIs to industry over the course of about a year. We got fantastic feedback. And by fantastic, I don't mean everybody came back and said, this is great. Uh, we wanted critical feedback because what we messaged the whole time is, hey, we're doing this and we're gonna require all of our programs to comply. And that means we're requiring anybody that's working with the Army to be able to comply. And so we wanna know where this is not gonna work. We want you guys to tell us, you know, what are the things that are not, um, that don't make sense, that there's not solutions for, that we're not gonna be able to implement. And so that's why we took our time in terms of releasing the final releasable version, if you will, uh, but that happened in March as well. So UDRA 1.0 was co-signed by ASALT and the Army CIO and CDO. CDO is within the Army CIO. Um, so it's really an Army reference architecture. <clears throat> the software directive requires everybody within six months of signature, which was early March, to begin complying. So. One of the things that we also did that I talked about at a previous conference in March is we launched what we're calling the Innovation Exchange Laboratory, or IXL, that you see up on the chart. And the IXL is a cloud-based IL2, pretty low bar to entry, and we did that on purpose so that people can come in, industry can come in uh, without CACs and without you know, a whole bunch of you know, IL5 type of effort to um, test your solutions, your data solutions, against our UDRA implementation. So it's being run for us on our behalf by DEVCOM C5ISR Center up at Aberdeen Proving Ground. And we spent about the last six months building an implementation of the UDRA so that we could do this. And we've been talking about it and telling industry it's coming, okay, it's here. Um, so now we have gotten a lot of interest already from industry and I'm hoping that, you know, by telling all of you guys here that we're going to get some more because what we really, I think it, it serves two purposes, right? I think it, it serves a purpose for us because 
it will give us feedback on how many solutions are out there that just out of the box are going to work and how many solutions are going to need work, which obviously is a business decision for you guys, right? We're not, I mean, it, you, you, the industry will decide what they want to do if it doesn't comply. Um, but it gives us some information on what's really out there that will be easy plug and play. Uh, and for industry, if you're interested in doing work with the Army, it gives you feedback on, you know, what, what would you have to do um, if you wanted to comply, if you don't already, maybe you do, and if you don't, then what, what's needed, and then go from there in terms of you know, making those business decisions. So QR code um, will take you to our site where you can download the UDRA. We have 450 downloads already, and we just released it a few weeks ago, so I'm pretty excited about that, and hoping those numbers go up today. All right, so finally, Data is critical for a lot of reasons. AI, obviously, is one of those reasons, right? So the Army is serious about AI. And you know what? We have to be, because our adversaries are clearly very serious. They're investing a whole lot. And so you know, DOD and the Army um, need to be on the same wavelength. So there's a few things that we're doing um, that I want to talk about, but I think there's also gaps that exist. I think we've all gone kind of headfirst into like generative AI and chat GPT and LLMs, and they're great. I mean, they, they certainly are time savers, uh, but it's, it's very different when you're talking about that and like writing an email using chat GPT than it is developing an algorithm that we're going to give to our soldiers that's going to you know, take a bunch of data and give them information that they have to be able to trust, right? And we all know today, we can't really trust what the tools are giving us. You have to check it. And so, you know, we're not there yet. I mean, that's really the bottom line. So there's a few things that we're, we're doing. Number one, Project Lynchpin, which you may have heard of, that is really our flagship AI program. And they are going to develop a trusted and secure MLOps pipeline that other programs will leverage. So they're really about what are the processes that we can use to get to open architectures so that we have some insight into the algorithms. We're not vendor locked with vendors. We're able to plug and play different algorithms. Um, and we are able to pivot to the best solution whenever that is, right, whoever's providing that. But also from a security standpoint, um, how do we know that they work? Because AI is different than software. It's not deterministic. And so testing AI is not just running a bunch of test cases. That's not going to work. So what are the things that we need to do to make sure that they work? And what are the things that we need to do to make sure that they are not going to give us the wrong information, right? Data poisoning, huge risk. Um, an enemy or you know, the bad guy taking control of the algorithm, spoofing, all of those things are risks. And so there's a lot of gaps. So Lynchpin's awesome, and they're doing great things, and you know, they're going to help us to build that pipeline. But in addition to that, we're also launching a 100-day and a 500-day AI implementation plan. So we're going to start the 100. We're going to kick off the 100 days very soon, and that's really going to help us to get after number one across ASALT. What are our requirements? Because right now we don't 100% know across all of our hundreds of programs who needs AI, and so that's going to help us scope. And then what are, the, what are the things that we can kind of, what's the low-hanging fruit out there that we can leverage from industry or wherever, academia, um, to solve some of the gaps that I talked about? And then the 500-day plan is really going to expand on that with the intent of being able to, within 500 days, say, you know what, we think we have these problems relatively solved and we're confident that we can enter into AI implementation and deliver safe and secure algorithms to our soldiers and our users. So um, that is coming soon. We did develop a risk framework um, because you know, we know that testing and security are going to require different levels depending on, number one, where am I? What's the consequence of bad information? So, you know, like I said, with ChatGPT, if you're writing an email, eh, okay, it's not that big of a deal. 
but if you're at the pointy tip of the spear, that's a problem. And so there's going to be different levels, we think, of you know, testing and validation that ne and security that need to be done depending on where the algorithm is. So it's not going to be like a cookie cutter, same thing for everybody. So I think my time is about up, and I don't want to go over. So thank you so much. I'm super excited to be here. Thank you to Appian uh, for having me. And I look forward to hearing all the other great speakers. Thanks. <laughs>